Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring contribution and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, I'm back from my annual Mother's Day tradition of leaving the country. Um... It's a thing I do. Amy and I spent a long weekend in Toronto, ostensibly for the Toronto Comic Arts Festival or TCAF, but really just to chill out, hit some great restaurants and, and let our dog, Bendico, hang out with one of his greyhound pals back in New Jersey. I also got a bunch of podcasts recorded, including part of this week's show, as well as some leads for future episodes that I did not think were going to come up. Um, so that was kind of neat. And then I just generally had some conversations with pals and past guests and, and some family I have that lives up in Toronto. And, and I bought a bunch of books, although I really spent less than half an hour at the Comic Arts Festival itself. I, I sort of went into the reference library, did a quick walkthrough, did a second one on the second day with Amy to, to pick up something she wanted. And that was pretty much it. I, I got more out of the, the conversations in the hotel lobbies and stuff like that. So, Oh, and on top of all that, um, we also got to experience a minor earthquake on Sunday night when the Raptors won Game 7 of their series against the Sixers with a buzzer-beater shot by Kawhi Leonard. I swear I could feel the building shake, or the entire city. Um, they don't get a lot of great moments like that for, for basketball up there, so I'm awfully happy for them. Anyway, I got some minor travel in the week ahead. Uh, FDA trip on Wednesday, DC visit this weekend for Amy's goddaughter's college graduation, but no podcast lined up for either of those jaunts, which is for the best. I came out of this weekend with four episodes. I had three that for various reasons fell through in the days leading up to the weekend, two that were added on an impromptu basis. Um, the net is you guys get some great conversations and I could use a little rest. So now, let's get on to the show. This week, you get two conversations, not one, uh, both with the great cartoonist and past pod guest, Seth. Seth has a new book out, but it's one that began more than 20 years ago. It's called Clyde Fans, and it was a serialized comic or story he began in his main comic back in the 90s. And he's worked on it on and off since then. Uh, the completed version just came out from his longtime publisher, Drawn and Quarterly, and they were kind enough to invite me to interview Seth last week at the Strand Bookstore in New York City, near the end of his, his mini-book tour. Now, Seth and I had recorded twice before at TCAF, uh, just one-on-one, -on -one, though, no no audience. This is our first time in front of other people. And, uh, and afterwards, I asked him if he'd be okay with recording a one-on-one -on -one this weekend, since I had a bunch of questions that... That just wouldn't have been great in front of an audience. See, one of the um, one of the aspects of doing more than three hundred of these episodes is that I have figured out things that work one on one, things that work with an audience, especially with a, a very thoughtful and ruminative artist like Seth. Some questions are going to lead him into working his way through his response in the act of responding. I find that sort of stuff totally illuminating, but. Not necessarily the best mode for a public event. So I tried to tailor my questions at the Strand to things he could more readily answer and, and kind of riff on. And I saved the the more pensive ones for, for our Toronto hotel session. And in fact, some things that he said during the Strand, I made notes about to ask him this time around. So you'll get to hear the Strand session first and then the TCAF one. Now, they're both fun talks. Um... The one nice thing about the Strand event, one of the many nice things, uh, first, we recorded up in the rare books room on the third floor, which is a wonderful space. Um, but there are some really neat comic 
or comic book luminaries in the the audience. Uh, Bob Sikoriak and Summer Pierre, both of whom are past guests of the show. Uh, Adrian Tomina, Art Spiegelman, who came up to say hello afterwards and and tell me, oh yeah, we we really ought to do one of these sometime. Um, I also pitched Adrian on on doing the podcast, so I've got tentative approvals from from both of them. Uh, but it was nice to see the sort of artist who Seth attracts to this sort of event. Oh yeah, also Dan Perkins, uh, the great political cartoonist Tom Tomorrow, and one of my podcast pals turned out for it too. Um, so kind of a neat and varied comics crowd. But anyway, so that was the Strand. Uh, they were wonderful. They gave me their audio file the next day, so I didn't have to use my more um, echoey version that I'd, I'd set up. Um, so all thanks to The Strand, all thanks to Drawn and Quarterly. We have a, a great opening conversation. Oh, um, I forgot to tell you about Clyde Fans. Seth's new book is is a gorgeous piece of work. A, as a physical object, it's absolutely wonderful. Comes in this, this great slip case. The whole thing is that level of, of production that Drawn and Quarterly puts into these sorts of books. But but the thing about Clyde fans to me that's fascinating is is how it lays out the evolution of Seth's art and storytelling over the two decades it took him to to make the book. And the early sections just look and feel much different than the style he now works in. And while it wouldn't be distracting to a, a normal reader, it's not distracting to me either, but it's interesting to see how those things changed and how... You know, how as he engaged in a project like that, where it's all going to be collected in a single volume, um, how the, the work itself serves as signposts and markers of how he evolved as an artist. Now, if Clyde Fans is about anything, and that's part of what we, we talk about, it's about a pair of brothers whose father started a fan company in a small city in Ontario. Uh, the older brother tells an unseen observer stories about sales techniques and alludes to his brother's obsessions and, and failed attempts at engaging the outside world and and details the rise and fall of the company, all in the opening section of the book. And from there, we start to move around in time and see these key points in their lives. And, and it builds toward this epiphany that's, that's decades in the past, but is also at, at the core of the mystery of their relationship and and how they all evolved and how they got into the, the world that they settled into. Um, it's sort of like the book itself. See, um, we see the changes that Seth underwent as an artist, but it's only through, through seeing these moments accumulate that we understand, well, in this case, the, the tragedy of the brothers. Clyde fans is an amazing work by a, a great cartoonist and artist. And it was an honor to be invited by drawn and quarterly to interview him at the strand. Um, let's get on with it. Caveats, not a lot. The Strand's recording right off the soundboard is better than that of my mics on the little table between me and Seth. Uh, in the hotel for part two, Seth moved around a little, and that made some, some fabric noise. Now here's Seth's bio. Seth is a cartoonist behind the comic book series Palookaville, which started as a pamphlet and is now an occasional hardcover. His comics have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Best American Comics, and Timothy McSweeney's Quarterly Concern. His illustrations have appeared in numerous publications, including the cover of The New Yorker, The Walrus, and Canadian Notes and Queries. He is Lemony Snicket's partner for the series All the Wrong Questions, and he designed several classic comics reprint series, notably collections of work by Charles Schultz, John Stanley, and Doug Wright. His other comics include It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, George Sprott, and Wimbledon Green. His new book is The Collected Clyde Fans by Drawn and Quarterly. He was a subject of the National Film Board documentary Seth's Dominion. Seth lives in Guelph, Canada with his wife Tanya and two cats in a house he has named Inkwell's End. And now, a couple of new virtual memories conversations with Seth. I guess my first question is, um, are you happy not to have to answer questions about finishing Clyde Fans? <laughs> well, I am happy that Clyde Fans is done, although I feel like I've been answering questions about the end of Clyde Fans for a straight week now because of the book. Um, but I will be kind of happy to have it out of my life. 
um, a lot of people think that there have been several people have asked me, are you going to be sad that you're not working on it anymore? And uh, the answer to that is absolutely not. Um, I don't think, like think people have the idea that you do, when you have a long standing project that you're going to develop like an emotional attachment to it that means you're going to be sorry it's over. And maybe that's true for someone like Charles Schultz who didn't have this idea that there was an official end that he was supposed to be reaching. But, um, you know, I was supposed to be done that book in about five years, so as it lingered on to be 20 years, that did not, it was not something that I was proud of. But I was like, oh, I can't let go of it. Mm -hmm. It was like, I just can't finish it. Um, so I was more than happy when the moment came where I was like, and there were two or three moments where it's like, I'm done. There was the, I'm done the last chapter, then I'm done fixing it up for republication, and then I'm done the design of the book. And those were, that was the real one, done the design of the book. It's like, I don't have to look at this again, and I don't have to draw these characters anymore, <laughs> hopefully ever again. So I'm, I'm glad that it's out there. I'm proud of it, but I'm glad I'm not, I don't have another chapter to, to work did, on. Did you have the fourth moment of seeing the physical book itself? Did that have any sort of resonance for you? You know, it did. I was, but mostly, you know, I've lost some of the thrill of that. In the old days when you were working on comics and that box of comics would arrive, you'd open it up so excited. It was such a big deal. Oh, my God, here's my work in print. And you'd look at it and there was always some misprint that would break <laughs> your heart, always something. But there was such a sense of joy. And I think maybe over the years, two things have happened. One is that um, it's less of a surprise because you've gone through it digitally a hundred times and you've actually had like a printed copy sent to you at some point that was all messed up so that you fixed, okay, this is all wrong, blah, blah, blah. So you've held it at some point even. Um, a, a certain amount of that surprise of opening the box is gone. Now, I'm sure the, still, the bad surprise still exists where you open the box and it's like, it's terrible. Actually, but the title the other on side, page 252 I wanted to point. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm sure there's a misprint in there, and Chester Brown will tell me about it with great joy. Um, <laughs> but to be honest, when it came, I opened it up and I looked through it, and there was a sigh of relief. I was happy. It looked good. I put it on the shelf, and that was, you know, it was over. Speaking of Chester, though, had you ever considered what he did with Underwater, with just surrendering on Clyde fans the way Chester no, had done No, no, never. Underwater? I always joke with Chester that, like, everyone considers him such a great cartoonist, but he's quit about four jobs in the middle. <laughs> it's like he's got several projects that never got finished, and so I, can, I certainly I have a bit of, like, I can rub this in his face, so for sure. <laughs> I actually finished it. And, yeah. and is there any truth that you and Jason Lutz had a competition to see who could go longer? No, no, that okay. just happened that way, but I eventually, I was, I think mine did go longer, and I was proud. I think it might have only been a few weeks, but I was like, I win. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, though, how did you, oh, your art changed significantly over those 20 years, your storytelling changed. Can you sort of characterize both what those changes were and, and how you tried to keep that level of continuity yeah. within the work? Well, you know, the interesting thing is I don't feel the story changed. The story was planned out from the beginning, and I knew exactly what I was going to do in the book, and that never changed. In fact, that stayed remarkably the same. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I, knew, I didn't write a script, but I knew that like, every point I would be hitting in the arc of the story, and it was planned out. I knew scene, kind of scene to scene what would happen. Um, but I think a lot of people who aren't cartoonists see that as that's like the writing. But that's not really the writing. That's just like you know the plot points. Um, the writing occurs like when you do the actual drawing. So with sitting down to those scenes when you get to them after like 10 years, that process of drawing it on the page, that's the writing. It's like even though, you know, like people would say, well, isn't the writing the words? And it's like, no, the writing is the actual process of bringing it to life. The example I've been using on this tour a lot is that it's a lot like if you had, you made some notes and, and then you draw it, it's kind of like I have some lyrics and then I put music to it. Mm -hmm. It's that's what turns it into a song. Without the music, it's just a poem. It's like the, the, the drawing of the comic is where suddenly all the things are discovered. You're working on it, and like, sure, you work out the pace of it and the panels and little, little thumbnails, but that actual process of working on the page, connections occur between the panels, the way you design it, all this sort of stuff, has a tremendous effect that changes what you think it's going to be, and the drawn version is like literally not, exa not what you're thinking. So, of course, what I did in 1997 in like the first chapter is going to be quite different than how I close the book because my whole approach to how I draw and design and storytell, like how you pace it, how, you, how many panels you use, that's changed a lot over 20 years. 
And um, I think even like at some point I just gave up on the idea of trying to have any consistency in the artwork itself. The only thing I stuck to, like that I had to stick to, was that I had an upper, co upper lower lettering style I was using in the beginning, that by about 15 years in, I had abandoned on everything else, <laughs> but I had to carry it through. I hated, the, I hated doing that lettering in the last few chapters. And in fact, I started to do this thing where I had a couple of different kind of like voices in quotes, so I could skip to the all capitals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you characterize the, what, what you got better at, I suppose, how the storytelling yeah. changed? It got more refined. Yeah. I would say it got more sophisticated. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a natural process of any craft. If you work on it for a long time, the subtleties of it become, um, you, you just, you learn them. I mean, I know better how to tell a good comic story now than I did when I started it. I look at the first um, chapter of Clyde Fans and I can see that there is, it is pretty straightforward and it's just I'm doing, I'm, I'm using the skills that I always learned as, even as a teenager on how to be a cartoonist which is there are some things happening in the panel and there are some words and you're trying to make you know an interesting uh, juxtaposition of the two but to some degree it's pretty straightforward. People are walking around, they're talking to each other. I wasn't giving a huge amount of thought to the design of the page as a whole. I mean I was but not to the degree I was later. Um, I think so much of what changed is literally me trying to boil down like what my drawing was about to simplify, to like make think, to understand um, the graphics and how they work on the page, how the eye moves around. There's a lot more of that going on at the end of the book than there is at the beginning. And was that something you learned intuitively, or you know, was that something that you sort it's of intellectualized? It's a bit of both. I think like anything, even when you're studying and trying really hard to do it, there is a kind of intuitive leap that occurs whenever anything gets better, and you can't really fully. Um, you can't really say that that's just from studying and learning. Something happens. The interesting thing about any kind of craft is something is coming from the hand. It's like it's not all come from, from the brain. And uh, I mean, when I, it, it's interesting how much the hand is like an element in what you do. When I went back to try and fix the earlier chapters, like I could only go back to about halfway through the book. When I went to the first chapter and tried to like, add a panel in, I just like literally couldn't draw anything like that anymore. It's like it would have been easier to imitate some other artist's artwork than to imitate my own. Like Kayla? I'm yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there that temptation to, to sort of revisit the there whole thing? There was some fixing, I mean, yeah. in the beginning. There's quite a bit of fixing in the middle of the book. Yeah. There was a bunch of stuff that happened in the middle of the book that I was waiting to finish to come back and correct. Um, that was, that's one of the great um, values of serializing something is you get a second shot. So that stuff in the middle, like the chapter three, I changed quite a bit of stuff. Chapter four a bit, chapter five very little because it was done so recently. Chapter two, I made clarity issues I started to clear up, things that just didn't read well. Chapter one, it was almost nothing I could change without changing it all. And, it, and I considered it for a second, like maybe I should redraw chapter one, but then I was like, there's two more years, and then chapter two will look wrong, and it's like some point you just got to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need anything more to do with this book. And you mentioned in the afterward that sort of um, reaching that conclusion. You also mentioned this is essentially the last long form, long, long form work of yours. Probably. Yeah. You never know. I mean, I'm working on this memoir right now that was supposed to be 80 pages, and it's at about 300 right now. So <laughs> it could keep going. But it's done in such a, pro, uh, like a perfunctory sketchbook style. I don't feel like any of that torture of, like, that it has to be, you know, it has to be good. It just has to, like, do what it's supposed to do. That I feel like maybe I will just keep drawing that for another 300 pages. Maybe it'll end up being even bigger. But somehow or other, it won't be the struggle. Mm -hmm. that Clyde Fans was. And does the sort of story of Clyde Fans appeal to you nowadays? You mean with, like... What you were trying to do, I guess, with, with I don't know book. what I was trying to do, and that's the yeah. funny part. It's like uh, at most of the uh, media stuff I've been doing, people will start and talk to me about how it's a story about like um, progress and how these, young, these men who sold fans weren't prepared for air conditioning and how they were crushed under the wheels of progress, and I think, oh yeah, that's in there. But I don't think that's really, like, at this point, I'm not sure that I had, like, a theme or a plan. I just knew I was interested in these two characters, and I was going to explore their lives through a variety of different, like, storytelling approaches. And I trusted that somehow this 
cyclical or elliptical kind of odd story would um, come together. And, um, and I'm happy with how it came together, but I'm not 100% sure if I'm the person who can figure out what the book's about. Has anybody else read it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the way through? Okay. We'll, we'll take guesses during the Q&A and see, see if somebody comes up with a good no. one. Um, but what sort of story appeals to you nowadays? Oh, what do I like to read? Well, what, Both what read kind of, and what inspires or, or the writing. Draw? As yeah. I've been getting older, I find I'm... The thing I'm really interested in is things that don't have a lot of conflict in them. I've been writing a lot of... Uh, the more I write, the more I'm trying to write works that have very little to no conflict in them. Uh, it's hard to write something that has no conflict in it because mm -hmm. even just the slightest kind of narrative tension is some sort of conflict. But I do find, I think it kind of occurred to me a few years ago that almost everything I like was kind of low-key, kind of boring. Um, like things that like uh, a lot of people would say, well, that's not interesting, that's boring. And I'd be like, no, it's actually very fascinating. And I realized it might just be that I'm uh, kind of get turned off by too much bombast. There's so much bombast in the culture that I was starting to get drawn to like, you know, things that seemed the exact opposite. And even films I liked. I'd be like, that's a great film or a book. That was a really great book, but I wish it had just a little less conflict, in it, I would say. <laughs> so I'm kind of, now that that's come up in my mind as like a clear idea, I've been trying to like incorporate that more fully into what I'm doing. Like you'd look at Clyde Fans and you might say, well, there's a good example of something that doesn't have a lot of conflict in it. But I look back at it and I say now, oh yeah, there's a lot of conflict oh, in there. I would have cut filled. it way down. The, 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 the conflict between the brothers and, and exactly, what their lives are yeah, is, is yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's full of conflict. It's like mm -hmm. if I wrote that now, I'd have edited all that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, you mentioned being an only child, um, writing that sibling dynamic and the mm -hmm. sense of family that pervades Clyde fans' experience, uh, imagination. There is a different, there's a word you missed in there. And I said I was essentially an only child. Yeah, I know. I'm not an only child. I have uh, older brothers and sisters. Um, they all, um, they all were old and moved out like before I was like, you know, even a toddler. So I grew up like in a much later family than my brothers and sisters and a very different family. Um, so the family in Clyde Fans is actually like has a lot to do with my own family um, in that it was my family was essentially me and two older parents. And in Clyde Fans, the, uh, the figures of the mother and the father really hang over the family, even though the father is absent and you never see him. Um, my father was a lot like that. He was, you know, he had a, a separate life, a secret life, and was not around very much. And um, that uh, kind of, and he was also kind of terrifying. So that uh, element of dread hanging over, like, the family that's in Clyde is, you know, doesn't come from nowhere. Did your sympathies towards the two brothers shift over that time? Well, I like them both, even though it's pretty obvious that Simon is the one who gets the easier narrative position because he's the shy, uh, pain, painfully struggling brother, and Abe is much more of an aggressive kind of a jerk. But the truth is, um, I relate to them both tremendously. I mean, Abe is a very uh, gregarious, outgoing person who feels a certain kind of resentment that he's been forced to deal with the world, and um, that's very much like me. I'm, you know, I'm not a shy person. I'm not a quiet person. Um, I don't, it's like, I, 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 I'm out in the world, but on the same sense, I, same, same as Abe, I have a lot of problems dealing with people socially. Um, it's stressful. Um, I, if I went out, I could spend the evening with you. We'd have a great talk. But then I go back to the hotel room, I'd be very stressed about it. It's like there's a lot of psychic hangover going on. Um, Simon, on the other hand, is like painfully shy and like withdrawn. And I can relate to that very well because 90% of my life is spent alone in my studio. That's the life where I'm most comfortable is being a person. It's like I really like myself when I'm in the studio because when you're in the studio, it's like you think this is the real me. You're not seeing yourself reflected off of other people. There's no conversations. You're not, you're not making any mistakes. Um, it's interesting how you think like that's the real me. But then you go out in the world and you deal with people and it's much more complicated. You think to yourself, maybe this is the real me is the person, what this, this force that comes out to interact with other people. It's complicated. I'm not really sure what the answer is. I know what the flattering answer is, but I'm not sure what the true answer is. Who is the real you? See, and you were saying you didn't want any drama or tension in yourself. That, that's well, I don't want it, but <laughs> Yeah, but it's there, it's there in, in yeah. all your background of stories. Yeah. Um, how did you change 
over the course of those those 20 years? Do you look at older pages and sort of see Seth's past? In, in well, I certainly see my artistic influences changing. Yeah, but it, does it also code for you as a person? Let me think about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not sure if I do. It's hard to say. It's funny that when you draw comic art, there is a sort of... Uh, imprinting uh, quality that goes on that like to some degree who you were and what you were doing gets like kind of printed into the page and Mm -hmm. when you look at it you kind of remember the circumstances of who you were and where you were when you do it some of it is long lasting and something some of it's fleeting sometimes you'll draw an image and like a week later you'll look at it and remember the song you were listening to when you drew it but that tends to fade it's like two more days later and you don't remember that but some stuff stays there some stuff you're like, I drew this in the middle of that really horrible relationship I was having when I was considering killing myself. Which you know, is, stuff like that gets in there. Yeah, the same thing that songs do for yeah. us, which yeah. I think Summer over here can also attest in her recent book. Yeah. Uh, do you still loiter around old storefronts? Do I what? Loiter around old storefronts. <laughs> I do still love old storefronts, but you know, there's been a tipping point in Canada. A lot of that stuff's gone. Walking around New York, even, I see it's not quite as rich as it used to be, but more in America, there is more old stuff than there is in Canada for the simple reason that there were an awful lot more Americans than Canadians. Mm -hmm. So in Ontario, like that lingering old culture is like most of it has stopped lingering. It's disappeared, Um, especially in a place like Toronto, where there's been a lot of money, a lot of redevelopment. When I first saw the Clyde Fan storefront that became the inspiration for the book, it was just one of many old storefronts, and I noticed it specifically because it had a very nice hand-painted sign, and uh, you know, and looked in, and it was interesting. But there were other nice storefronts that could have been the book could have been called Federal Printing or uh, So and So's Hats or something. You know what I mean? Now Toronto, I don't see those kind of places hardly ever. Mm-hmm. It's like that has, and to some degree, when you think about it. Those businesses were old. I mean, Clyde Fans was probably a business from the 40s and the 50s, and it made its way into the late 80s before it died. That's like, that's 40 years ago. It's, it's like all those kind of businesses had to survive if somebody in the family wanted to run them. And even like an old dry cleaner, you, say, you see like, nobody, nobody's kids wants to run the old dry cleaner. They've gone to college. They want to do something else. These businesses are really, like, I think the tipping point has occurred. Most of that stuff is disappearing fast. Well, we even see it here at the Strand. It's, it's family ownership. There's a history yeah. with the building, et cetera, because otherwise a place like this doesn't exist yeah. in no, the West Village. for sure. Because they want to put up more green glass towers of condos. Yeah, so. yeah. Now, let me ask, within the, the span of your career, where does Clyde Fans fit in for you? Is it, I mean, it was going to be your second book. Yeah. And it is now seventh, eighth. Yeah, it'll be an important book. The truth is, it'll probably end up being the big book, the the, the career-defining book, I suspect, (laughs) even in the fact that it's, you know, there's strange elements to it, the fact that it took so long to do, and it's the way it's constructed. I do think that, like, it's the big book, and that will... I think that alone will make it the book that has some impact in my career. But... It may be the transition book, too. It may be the book of before Clyde and after Clyde. These are the works he did after that was over. Uh, like every artist, I think the best work is coming. Hmm. So, um, but, you know, but like every artist, you don't know when the best work isn't coming anymore. There comes a point where it's all downhill. Um, I'm hoping that's still another decade or two before that starts, but you never know. I'll give one last question before we turn over to the audience. Hmm. Um, do you recharge by working in other media like this? You, you mentioned the bronze statue, the animation. Yeah. You know, what well, role does other I, work play? Yeah, I feel like my, my, like my studio process has changed. I think when I started out, it was all comics and all cartooning. Uh, that was a different time. And I think that, that was a... Um, you might even say there was kind of a holy war going on because we wanted to prove, like my generation of cartoonists and the generation just before me, um, they wanted, we wanted to prove that comics you know, could be art, they could be a serious medium for adults, and I think that um, that, can, that took up a lot of my mental space. I was extremely interested in cartooning and extremely interested in the history of cartooning and digging the past out at that point, finding your own ancestors. That filled up my whole artistic life. But somewhere in the last 20 years, I feel like a lot of that has changed. One thing is I think that battle for the graphic novel or comics has kind of been won. 
Um, you don't find the kind of pushback about that anymore that you used to. Uh, I'm seeing great graphic novels come out from young cartoonists who didn't feel, they didn't have to fight any battle at all. They felt like comics were a serious art form and they just started making comics. They grew up reading Dan Clowes or Chester Brown or whatever and they just, you know, they're making great comics. They're putting them out. They, they don't feel like they should be slighted and art schools are, te are teaching classes in it and your book, my books are in university courses. It's like something changed. Uh, there was a time back when I started out when people laughed at the idea that you could make a serious story in a comic book. Um, that was a joke. That was like saying I could make a serious story with whoopee cushions or something. It's just like people didn't think that was that, you know, that whole, but um, it's interesting how that world of high and low has changed. Mm -hmm. But besides that, I think feeling that, um, that battle being won has also kind of freed up a lot of mental space for me. And I feel that in the last 10 years, or maybe 20 years, I've just slowly started to have a studio process that involved a lot of other stuff. And I'm, I'm really invested in like working in my sketchbooks or my diaries or making objects. I'm making a lot of objects now working with other craftspeople. And um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm working on, including still working on my imaginary city and making all, you know, writing long, detailed uh, books about this stuff. I've got a ton of material on that stuff nobody's ever seen. But I feel now, I don't feel so like that I'm, ju I'm just doing cartooning. I feel it's all part of a bigger, uh, they're all connected. The cartooning now is, is connected to making the objects too. They're all part of one discipline. And the discipline is the studio. That working in the studio. Working in the studio, to me, that process is what's exciting. It's not so much the end products as as doing the stuff. There's something extremely um, satisfying about coming down into the studio each day and uh, puttering around with things. Was there an artist whose who, who's studio world really captured you that made you think of you know that environment as hmm. opposed to the you know the drawing table? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of artists I've been inspired by the fact that they've worked on a variety of stuff, and it might be hmm. more like a catch-all of different people, like yeah. somebody like. Like Alexander Calder is very exciting because he's like working on the circus, making the mobiles, making the wire figures. It's like there's a wide variety of stuff going on there. Or you look at a lot of the modernists, um, you know, like uh, Miro or Picasso, you know, they'd be doing sculptures one day and then doing, uh, um, you know, paintings the next and then doing ceramics. Or actually, you know, I'm very, I've been very inspired by Matisse lately, those paper cutouts. It's interesting that like, I've been doing a lot of cutouts, although not necessarily, they weren't actually because of Matisse, it was actually because of Hans Christian Andersen. But I started looking a lot at those beautiful cutouts of Matisse, and it's, like, it's so interesting to see like this graphic work he was doing at the end of his life. He said it himself. It was like he finally found his own medium. And something about it to me, when I look at that, I'm like, that is the Matisse work for me that comes to life. The paintings are beautiful. But I wouldn't have five books of Matisse's paintings in the house. But give me five books of those cutouts for sure. I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Um, uh, I was just going to ask, like, if there was a point in working on Clyde fans that you feel like was sort of your lowest point in it, where you, you felt the most frustrated with it or were the closest to giving up on it? Yeah, it was probably about the last... 12 years, I think. But <laughs> no, truthfully, I mean, I think, it, I don't think it was, it's interesting when I look back on how I worked on it, it was pretty cold in the sense that, like, I, I, if to answer the question fairly, I'd say probably at about 10 years, I felt pretty embarrassed and I felt bad about it. I felt like people were asking, like, when's the next book coming out or when's it going to be done? And at that point, it seemed like everybody thought, like, I was just like a short distance from finishing. They'd, thinking that there'd be like a conclusion within a year. And so that I was always kind of lying to everyone. So people would say, when's, it, when's the finish coming out? And I'd be like, oh, I'm working on it, or it's coming soon. And I knew that like it was not coming soon. It was going to be a long stretch. So I was pretty embarrassed. And I continued to plod on. But I think at some point, that plodding process of just like every few months, like, you know, every year for a couple of months, I would work on it. And at some point, I just got into the headspace, like, this will take the time it takes. And at that point, I gave up caring what other people thought, because I knew that I was not going to be, you know, meeting any deadlines. Um, your work has always been incredibly soothing to me. I just like, you That's know, nice. drinking in the pictures and, and kind of spending time in your world. So 
I wanted to know, does that come from being inspired by, you said you like boring things, but is it more like you like soothing things? I'm I wondering. do. And then is the process of doing those drawings soothing for you? Um, and then my last question is just, has Guelph changed since you moved there? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, it, they, it is about soothing. And I am trying to make the stories and the images soothing. Uh, and it's funny, you know, I was thinking about this recently. I was thinking everything in my life is about soothing. And I thought, what the hell do I need to be soothed so much for? <laughs> it's like, it does seem like an overwhelming desire to always find some way to make myself feel uh, calm and, you know, to remove conflict like we were talking about. And I, I was thinking, that sounds like a bad artistic impulse to be like trying to create works that are soothing. I mean, people talk about art that it should be confronting. It should challenge people. Um, but you have to face, you do the work you do. And my work is not going to be about that. But it's funny, um, it is ultimately the goal I'm trying to create is something that has a very <coughs> calm interior line to it. Uh, and I feel like I'm working more towards that e than ever. The next book, which I've started on, is going to be very calm. Uh, I'm not sure, like, if you even get to make decisions about this sort of stuff. It's interesting that as an artist, you follow a thread through life, and it takes you places. You can fight it. Um, I don't think I know a single cartoonist who at some point hasn't tried to get away from their drawing style, where they said, like, I hate this. I, why do I draw like this? I'm going to change it. And inevitably, um, it's like losing weight. You know, you lose 10 pounds, then it creeps back on. It's like that drawing style comes back somehow, and then two years later, you're like, oh, shit. I'm doing it again. I'm tightening up or whatever it was you tried to get away from. It's like if you're too loose, you try to tighten up. If you're too tight, you try to loosen up. Um, I remember Chester Brown did that back when he did uh, I Never Like You. He changed his style, got very spontaneous, and then a couple years later, he was doing that super tight hatching that he was trying to get away from. But as for the third point, uh, Guelph has changed. My town um, where I live, it feels like it's kind of a little town in a medium-sized city. So I live downtown, and... Um, there used to be a rule that no building could be taller than the basilica, because the basilica stands on a hill, and it was the crowning point of the town. And uh, then somebody, they, some council person changed that rule and let them put up a tower, and now there's condos going up everywhere. There's a condo going up across from my house with a big uh, hipster brew pub in it. So, life changes. <laughs> uh, I saw that a composer put some, or he put George Sprott to music at a Vancouver gallery. Is there any chance that a greater audience will get to experience that work? That work will be coming out as an album from Drawn and Quarterly next year. In fact, we've been working on the design of it. That was a great project. Um, this guy, he sent me a few years ago, he just sent me a tape, or what was it? It wouldn't have been a tape. It was probably some, some CDs of a project he'd done. And he was a cellist, and, um, and uh, he composed music, and it was for another project, and I thought it was great. So he said, you know, would you let me make sort of a chamber piece out of it? And I was like, go to town. And then he spent a couple of years putting together sort of a... I'm not sure what to call it. He's, he called it, I think he called it, what did he call it, a Baroque uh, picture novel or something, because we couldn't come up with anything. Um, and then I went out there and, and um, for the first performances, because it has vocals and spoken parts, and I built like a big cardboard set. It was great fun. So um, we're going to, and we had lots of photos taken, so we're going to put together a very, you know, drawn in quarterly, high production value kind of box set of it, lots of pictures and stuff. And, and the truth is, the music is great. He did a, a beautiful job. It was very touching when I, uh, yeah, I was literally in tears watching it. Um, can you talk a bit about your palette and color? Sure. I thought you were applauding. I heard that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it was like, finally, someone asked about the palette. <laughs> um, it's funny, you know, I got a question about this recently, too. Like, why, why do you use blue so much, for one thing? And I was like, well, blue, of course, it's, I call it memory blue, because it's like, just, it's like, that's my own brand. And um, I think of blue and a sort of pale green as both being the ideal colors for a kind of reflective quality or for melancholy. But um, I think at this point in time, the way production values are in printing, people think that like, there's a really conscious choice for why I'm working in a duotone. And um, they forget that when comics, like alternative comics and underground comics, like back then, you couldn't get any color. So the printing was too expensive. So I remember when I started Palookaville, I had a very wispy, linear style, 
And I was used to doing some magazine illustration at that point and having some color. So I said to the publisher, Chris Oliveros, I said, I, can, I know I can't have any color, but could I have a gray tone? And he was like, yeah, you can have a gray tone. So then I started doing that very simple thing of putting some shading with gray tone. And then a couple years later, Chris said, you can have a color. And I was like, oh, I can have a color. And I said, I'll take blue. And so at that point, I had blue and gray, and you could put those together. And Clyde fans, you'll see it. It's, that's what's happening. Blue and gray together, you get a third color, a kind of a dark blue. That process of working on that over the years has just become familiar. Um, at this point, I could do anything in full color if I wanted. Um, it's not, Drawing Quarterly wouldn't be worried about the costs of that. Um, but I've become attached to that approach beyond just routine. I think that there's something about it that um, that suggests kind of an interior um, experience. It's like, different than doing it in full color. So, and I'm particularly attracted, particularly attracted to that blue. It's a particular code. I don't have it in my head at the moment. I stole it off of out of some French comic back in like the late '80s. I like clipped out a piece from a comic and then sent it to Drawn in Quarterly, like, this is the blue I want. Um, so, no, I mean, it's, the reasons were very prosaic, but in, in the end, um, I'm very committed to that, to that blue. Okay. Seth, I want to thank you for the, the time, and we're going to have a signing right over here for everybody's copies of Clyde Fans. Let's, uh, let's follow the author. And that was a live portion of the show. Thank you again to The Strand, and thank you to Drawn and Quarterly for making the whole event happen. Now, a few days later, Seth and I got together at the hotel for the Toronto Comic Arts Festival, or TCAF. And here's what we talked about. Something that came out of The Strand conversation uh, a few days ago where you mentioned that Clyde fans was basically the same story. Like, you had it in your head in the 90s, and it, it stuck with that. Do you work that way? nowadays with with storytelling do you do you see the whole shebang from the outset or is it a more organic process i know the memoir yeah. you mentioned is stretching on beyond where yeah. it should yeah it's funny i was going to say it's a bit of both because yeah. certainly in the next book i'm about to do um i know it all like not as fully as i knew clyde because it's um i had years of like um where i wrote notes before yeah but with this next book that's coming up like, while I was working on Clyde Fans, I had about five possible books in my head, like ideas for books that I was refining over the years. And I figured when the moment hit, I would pick one of those five books. But it didn't work that way. Uh, life is always this way. Mm -hmm. When I got to the, um, to the point where Clyde was officially done, a whole new story came into my head. And it came pretty fully formed uh, in the sense that, there's, like anything, there's an organic space in it that you, like, there's room for, like, writing it as I'm working on it. But I know it's got a pretty clear structure based on days and nights. So it'll be, it's, and I know exactly how it ends and blah, blah, blah. So it might take me a few years to do. Uh, let's say three <laughs> to five years and pray. But um, that that's an example that's like Clyde. Mm -hmm. It's like I knew where Clyde was going, I knew what it was all about, and then I followed to hit the, the hot spots along the way, or the high spots. And this will be just like that. I know exactly, you know, I haven't drawn any of it yet. I've been working on notes and figuring it out. But once I start, I know exactly where that first part will go and how it will work. I'll refine it, but that's it. But on the other side, uh, we were just saying, like, with the memoir, with uh, Nothing Lasts, that's more organic. I know, I mean, I know my own life, and I'm writing about my own life, so I know the narrative structure where it's going, but it could change around in any way. Like, the one good thing about Nothing Lasts that's different from another kind of story is if I forget something, I just, um, I'm not thinking I'll add it back in when I republish it, I'm thinking I'll just mention it now. So I could be, like, writing right now about, like, um, this restaurant I worked in as a teenager, and I might suddenly remember, I really should have talked about that experience I had with my mother when I was six. So as soon as I finish that little section, I might just say, this reminds here's me. something I forgot. Yeah. And then I could, so there's an organic quality of like just plugging things in. I know I'm, I know like I'm, I'm going to talk about that restaurant, then I'm going to talk about other jobs I had, then I'm going to talk about going to art school, you know, like there's a straight uh, chronological pattern. and yeah. subject driven. Yeah, like still. if I asked you, I said like, what's your life? How, what was the pattern? Like, what, 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 where did you do in your life? You'd have, <laughs> you could talk for an hour and tell yeah. me exactly what you did, I bet. 
Like you could say, like, where were you born? Yeah. Where you went to school? Who your, you know, who your first love was? Like all this stuff. It would be you'd have a chronology. But while you told it, you'd probably go, oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, actually, you need to know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, do you prefer one style over the other in those terms? Well, uh, I, I know like the memoirs are yeah. personal things. It's a yeah. different type of story. But do you find one more? Uh... Well, probably I like the organic one in a way because it's, um, in a strange way, it feels more like you're making art. Because mm-hmm. it's um, inspiration uh, based on inspiration. Um, it's quicker and it's more right there on the page. It's kind of the thing that I always say cartoonists can't do, which is just like rush to their studio and do a piece of work in a, a, a burst of inspiration. Right. It's not like painting a painting when you're making a comic. It's slow and boring. But with the sketchbook material, there is more of a quality of like you can just do it right now. I've been working on a couple of strips in my sketchbook right now, and I think, I've, you know, a couple of days where I felt like working on it, I could do a couple of pages in a day. And that I can't do a couple of pages of the finished work. Yeah. I could draw a page in a day or ink a page in a day, but it's different. Mm-hmm. And with those other book ideas you had, were those also, again, fully formed, basically, or were they more ideas that you wanted they to see where they go? They formed over time. Yeah. But they were more, like, pretty fully formed. Mm-hmm. Like, they, I may still come back to them. You never know. But it's like, yeah. how many years do I have? That's the question. So, that's. I think I was yeah. our very first conversation. You talked about yeah. me trying to put out a book a year, you know, a, a yeah. Palookaville per yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as a way of Yeah, know, I mean, ideally, I'd have. love to have, like, 50 volumes of Palookaville, but there's not. it's not possible. Even if I could do one a year, I don't have 50 years. <laughs> yeah, you can hire so, assistants, I'm just Yeah, kidding. no, no, it's... <laughs> You start to think about that as you get older. Yeah. I was just talking to Chester about that at breakfast. We were saying uh, it's not offensive to me anymore, the thought of hiring somebody else to do the drawing. Not that it's likely. No. But, but I was like, yeah, I could do it. I could work with someone. It was an Eddie Campbell thing for me. I mean, I was raised on you know the, the bullpen Marvel sure. comics yeah. where everything is an assembly yeah. line. But Eddie, first when he talked about drawing for Alan Moore... And mm-hmm. said, you know, I'm I'm the hands. This is Alan's mm-hmm. vision that I'm I'm helping. And you know, he, he had some comment about how Glenn Miller couldn't play a note, couldn't write music, but he knew mm-hmm. how to arrange and how to get a, a band yeah. together and make it work. Yeah. And he followed through with that in his later Bacchus stuff, where he, he just couldn't draw fast enough, so he brought in a bunch of other guys to, to do yeah. the work. Um, but again, comics is weirdly collaborative. It's a tricky medium yeah. because I mean, you can do it, and I think. Especially if you found the right collaborator, you sure. can do it. But it is a difficult task because, as I always say, so much of the writing occurs in the drawing. Yeah. And so it is complicated to think you could like hand that off to someone else. Mm-hmm. Although I do think maybe the best way it could work is sort of the Harvey Kurtzman way, which is you do pretty detailed roughs yeah. and then bring in people to finish it. And John Stanley worked that way, too. And that makes sense to me. I can't really imagine writing a comic where you hand someone a script. Yeah, that's a, everything yeah. seems to be driven by artist who does visual artist who does writing as yeah. opposed to you know a writer who has ideas for a comic but simply yeah, can't draw. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, and so. that always strikes me as a complicated thing. If especially if say you're working with someone like Alan Moore who has a lot of clout, he's handing you a full script. Mm. I I don't know if I could work that way. And an insanely detailed uh, yeah, script. Yeah, exactly. The funny one, I recorded with David Lloyd, the guy who did yep, V for yep. Vendetta, and that yep. was early in both of their careers. Yeah. And I asked him, did Moore have those crazy scripts? Yeah. And he's like, no. Not. We were both starting out, and if he handed me something like what he gave Dave for yeah. the, Dave Gibbons for The Watchman, I would have thrown it in his face and yeah. said, I'm the artist, you're the writer, You know, give exactly. me the words, and I'll, yeah. I'll make it look good. Yeah. Uh, no, but, I, I, yeah, I could never work with that kind of thing. It's like... Because so much of it was, it felt like it was the kind of thing like panel one, there are two armies approaching each other. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not drawing all that. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. And I imagine also giving you a strict panel structure for everything yeah, as opposed exactly. to, yeah, exactly. Let it, let it, it takes the joy out of life. Now, we asked about collaboration, though. Um, right after our, our Strand event, you were coming back up here to Toronto for the book launch and a monologue, a live monologue based on mm-hmm. the opening of Clyde Fans. Yeah. How'd it go? I loved it. It was really, you know, it was moving for me to watch. As a cartoonist, you almost never see anybody, like, um, say your words aloud. Mm -hmm. So it was really great to see this actor, Bill Bill Webster, Mm -hmm. um, to um, perform it. I was, like, quite interested in watching it. I would, it made, you know, it made me even more would like to write a play. It did. I mean, I was talking about this today with someone, too. It's like, 
wanting to write a play and writing a play are two different stories. Sure, sure. <laughs> and I was like, I could go home and write a play. I know nothing about theater except enjoying theater over the years. But uh, as a cartoonist, it's like you're not going to just go out and find a producer and hire actors. And it's like it's a whole it's like at 57, I'm not starting over as a playwright, but I sure would like somebody who's like, a, you know, some theater to come to me yeah, and say, course. would you write a play? <laughs> because then it's like you're entering into a pre-existing world. It's like any kind of other art form that I've encountered as I get older and people like ask me to do something. The big part of it is. You've got someone there who's going to guide you into it. Mm -hmm. It's it's like right now I'm making I'm making I think I may have mentioned to you I'm making a life size bronze sculpture. Yeah, I'm not a sculptor, and I'm certainly not sculpting those. I've got I've hired someone to sculpt them, and we've made models, and then there'll be a foundry, and through all of this stuff, I'm dealing with people who know what they're doing. That's what makes all the difference. But at the end, you've done something new. That's exciting. You know, it's like comics. I understand. And, but there's lots of other things that it would be fun to do, but you really do sometimes need to, that's where you really need to collaborate. And that's where my main collaborations occur. Now, with the, the monologue that this guy performed, was it, how close did it cue to the actual, what words on the page yeah. made it into the monologue? I well, guess. I wrote the monologue for him. So okay. I took chapter one and I boiled down the essence of it into about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and basically I said to them, you can cut anything you like, cause I'm not, you know, I'm not a playwright, yeah. but you can't add anything. So don't surprise me by right. adding yeah. something. <laughs> that's writing. when I killed my wife. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. And so, no, it was probably, a, it, you know, it was very faithful. Mm -hmm. I think they kept practically every word. And um, it was really interesting to see someone say them aloud and, you know, and emote them. Um, and, I was and, fascinated. And did that change in terms of, you know, what it looks like on the page versus, you know, some of the cadences and the it ways did. things are done it did. in a spoken it was interesting because, yeah, he put emphasis on things that I didn't emphasize in my mind. I mean, I can't drag them out right now what they were, but... It's the one you should have done all caps instead yeah. of the, the lower case that you were yeah, cursing out yeah. last time. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, I mean, this is always true when you see anyone else even write about your work. It's like suddenly you realize they're taking, they have a different take on it. Yeah. So it was interesting to see him bring emotion up into some part that, to me, wasn't particularly emotional and, yeah. and suddenly to realize that... That added emotion really made it work. Yeah, and it yeah. can resonate in a way yeah. that you were not predicting or yeah, weren't, weren't exactly. putting into your side of it. Yeah, I don't know if I'm reading your work accurately or remembering everything accurately. Yeah. To me, it seems like your early work is more urban focused. I mean, certainly the autobiographical yeah. stuff. Yeah. And there's much more nature centric, uh, you know, suburban, exurban, sure. and then yeah. you know, nature. Yeah, does that? Constitute a yeah. change of life for you or just a, you know, hey, the city isn't yeah. everything? I think it is a big part of moving away from Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, I don't live in the big metropolis anymore. I live in a small city and I get in my car, my wife and I, every weekend and drive to some other city, like other small city. Like we always leave our town of Guelph. So Guelph is located in a way you can drive to Hamilton, you can drive to St. Catharines, you can drive to Stratford. There's about 10 places within an easy 40 minute drive or a half an hour drive. And so you're going through the rural countryside all the time, rural Ontario. And progressively, I think my work is a lot more about that um, intermediary zone between city and country now. I yeah. think I still draw a lot of like urban landscapes, but they're smaller, not too many like skyscrapers in them anymore. Yeah. And lots of those rolling hills. I mean, the sure sign that my life had changed is that in my um, rubber stamp diary just recently, I had a bunch of rubber stamps made with hills and trees. And and the um, uh, poles with the power and, and phone lines <laughs> yeah. going across. Yeah, well, those also, are you know, always one those... of my fetishes, I must yeah. admit. <laughs> <laughs> it's your Bushmiller, you know, yeah, three rocks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I wondered if that was a... Um, when you noticed that was, was yeah. part of your... Uh, feeding into your work and, you know, what it meant in your, your life. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you don't always know these things. They creep in, and then you identify them. I'm mm -hmm. sure you're aware of this. Like, you must feel like there are elements, like, like, suddenly you have a realization about yourself. And then you realize, like, I should have realized this years ago, but things creep up on you. Like, when we were talking, I think I was talking to you. I don't know if this was on stage or not, but we were just talking about, like, the kind of men I write about, these sort of older white men, um, 
sort of big personalities, gregarious, um, pronounce, making pronouncements on things, kind of foolish often. And I was thinking, I was probably saying, yeah, my dad was a lot like that. Later when I was alone, I thought, I'm oh. a lot like that. <laughs> and I thought, I'd never even thought, I'm kind of writing about myself. And I've been thinking I've been writing about my dad. So, yeah. you know, this, it, it, but I should have realized that 10 years ago. You ever done therapy? No, I haven't. Me neither. And I, I wonder yeah. for both of us whether that would have helped in any way uh, recognizing yeah. some of those trends and patterns. I do think it's an interesting idea, the process. Like, mm -hmm. I think I do enough talking. I don't know if I need any more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's a degree to which we talk to cover up what we really feel. It's so true. That's, uh, that's very true. Yeah. Something we've we've also wrestled with, I'm sure, on and mm -hmm. off. Um, were you ever tempted to research the, the real Clyde fans? Only minorly. Yeah. Um, I think maybe about halfway through I started to think the thing is set, it's set in stone now. I don't have to worry about being influenced by the reality of that story. But I didn't pursue it. And I think the reason I didn't pursue it is obviously maybe I didn't even want to know. Maybe right. I'd like to just keep it as it is. So I've made a few comments on this tour about like how odd it is that no one from the family has ever contacted me who owned Clyde fans. There must yeah. be people out there or there could be people out there who that was their parents or grandparents' business. But another part of me is like very comfortable with them not contacting me because I'm wondering, do I even want to know the real story of that business? Do I want it to mix together in my head with the fantasy world I made up? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I don't know. I don't know. But I know I'm not pursuing it now. I think oh, now, yeah, again, it doesn't yeah. make any sense. To me, it, it's, it seems as though keeping the mystery is, is very important uh, yeah. in terms of yeah. we don't have to know everything, even though everything is at a, a Google it's search true. away. There's lots of stuff where you realize you don't need to know anymore, right. especially in your own life. Yeah, yeah, I could agree with that. I mean, that. have you ever contacted anybody you used to know, at, like from your past, through the computer, and then realized later... I should have left that in the past. There's a degree of that. And Facebook, the early curve of Facebook yeah. where you start reconnecting with everyone. Yeah. Um, it reminds me there, uh, of an episode of 30 Rock where uh, the lead character is going to her high school reunion, doesn't want to. She was ridiculed and bullied the whole time. When she gets there, she everybody is terrified of her and they're all staying away. And she discovers that, in fact, she was the bully who, okay. with her snide comments, yeah. was destroying everybody else's lives, but was completely unaware yeah. of this during okay. her, her teenage days. So, yeah, I'm more afraid of that happening where I find out that I'm really as horrible a person yeah. as I beat myself up about, but, you know, try and pretend I'm not. I said too much. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but another thing that actually came up that I was interested in from our, our yeah. pre-strand conversation you talked about, actually from, from the Strand conversation, you mentioned your book, um, some of your books are on college curricula now. They're, they're taught yeah. in schools. And that was part of the, you know, everything you guys were fighting for in terms of legitimizing mm -hmm. comics. Yeah. Do you wish when you were coming up that you could have been studying comics in school? Probably. It's yeah. funny. Um, it's complicated. You know, like I go down and I visit James Sturm's school. Yeah, at the, CCS uh, right here. I was yeah. wondering if you would have... Yeah, it's like I would like have that. gone there uh, if it, that existed when I was his age. And yet I'm not 100% sure that when I look back that I that, that would have been better. Mm -hmm. And this is no slam against James's school. I'm, I mean, it must be an amazing experience to go there at that age. But there was something powerful about figuring it out on your own. And the strange isolated world of comics from when I was young that I'm not sure I'd be willing to sacrifice. Um, how would I put this? It's like, maybe I, maybe it's just I'm stubborn, but maybe I like to be the one who, who made the rules instead of someone teaching me anything. Yeah. Um, what was most interesting about being a cartoonist in that era was the way you had to go find your own ancestors. There was like no academia. There was no great books on the history of comics. There were a few, but they were, you know, 70s. Kind of, you know, mid-range books on things. And they were also reflecting the biases of the... Yeah, the yeah, very much, yeah. yeah. So it's like you had to start digging. And that digging process turned almost everybody in my generation into a collector, first of all. I don't think it's necessary to See, be a collector. That's what I wonder. Did the yeah. collector thing follow the scholarly side of it? Or were these collectors who found a scholarly excuse to yeah. hoard comics? That's... <laughs> a bit of both, probably, I bet. Yeah, yeah it's funny. 
I mean, I think that like young cartoonists right now do not seem to be as much collectors as my generation. And mm -hmm. I think a big part of it is, is they don't need to collect. They can just go online. Yeah. They can read any old comics. They can look at comics. It's like, I don't, and in fact, I don't think they're that interested in the digging part anymore. That digging was really essential because you were like, I want to do comics, art, comics as art. You didn't really know what that meant when you were that age, but, and then you said like, are there any examples of comics as art? And then you'd look and you'd find the underground cartoonists. That's probably your first stop. You see Crum and Kim Deitch and stuff like that. But then you'd start digging back, looking into old stuff. You'd say like, oh, Charles Schultz was great. And eventually you'd dig back into the 50s, find Harvey Kurtzman, whatever. Work your way right back to the 20s with Frank King. Even into, you know, when I went through that process, I was like, like looking at any cartooning that existed. Punch Magazine, The New Yorker. Judge magazine from the 19th century, whatever, and that process of digging, and you you build your own list of ancestors, yeah, uh, or, uh, yeah ancestors. That's yeah. right. I was going to say descendants. No, I was going to say precursors. Yeah. Also, yeah, the exactly. ones that you you at least see as yeah. a template, or not template, yeah. but you know, style that you wanted to. to yeah, work and you in. built a narrative of how yeah. comic art worked and what the high points were, and that I think that whole process was a big process of building the canon. That canon, I don't think, is important to young cartoonists anymore because they've got their own canon. It's different. They didn't like that work has been done, and they can reject it. And I'm glad they can reject it. You don't need to. You don't need to look at old cartoonists to do comics. You just it's like anything. Yeah. But and not that there's no value in it, but I don't think it's required. Yeah. But, but it's I enriched think, when you have yeah, a, a greater knowledge of what came was. before. Yeah, and that was an important process, and I liked that schooling, so I wouldn't change it. But if I met a young cartoonist right now who was like as confused as I was at that age, I'd say maybe you'd be consider going to James Stern School mm -hmm. because um, it would be a place for two things that would be valuable that I didn't get. One is um, to be able to talk to older people who already know what the medium's about, people like uh, James himself or Steve Bissett who works there is great, um, or it's a place to be with other cartoonists your own age and experience who have similar goals and experience the excitement of shared creativity that I missed. Yeah. I didn't get that until Chester and Joe and I met and we were a little older then, mm -hmm. but certainly we were not, you know, in our early twenties at that point. Yeah. yeah and that's what I, I'd sort of wonder whether as great as it is that these sorts of programs exist, how much, yeah. you know, even if it's more the professional development side where, Oh, I got to meet people who can, can introduce me to people yeah. in New York yeah. and I can, you know, or LA now. Um, yeah, I just have no idea, you know, how you guys would have approached it if it was around when you were... Uh, yeah, it's, I'm sure out. we all would have went. And yeah. that's the funny part. But yeah. it's like, you do... And we yeah. would have hated each other also. Possibly. <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of Chester and uh, having breakfast with him this yeah. morning, did he find typos in, uh, in Clyde fans that he could ridicule yet. you He's over? He's just okay. read it, so I'm waiting. <laughs> He'll find one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how's the reaction been so far? We've only had a day or so of TCAF, but uh, now that people are seeing it in the wild, how it's the... I've been getting uh, a very positive reaction. I'm feeling, yeah, in a way, like, it's funny. I didn't expect the book to make a big splash when it came out. I've been working on it for 20 years, so it's, to some degree, I think of it as under the radar always. But I've been happy to see, like, new readers picking it up, and uh, I feel like the response has been very gratifying to see new people looking at it, not the people who've... Had all the installments yeah, exactly. for 20 years. Yeah, which... that's the eyes I'm kind of most interested in at the moment is somebody who's going to read that book from start to front as a book and see what they think. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Yeah. Which I did on a, yeah. a rainy Sunday a uh, week before we got together, yeah. which is a perfect weather to sit mm -hmm. down and read live fans. That was my... Uh, because I couldn't even remember the early mm -hmm. installments, which I do have in pamphlet form yeah, down in my... but I expect my... nobody to remember that. Right. No, I wouldn't remember. <laughs> I barely remember myself, so yeah. Um, well, speaking of that... It's something we've we've kind of danced around in the past, the acceleration of culture, the idea mm -hmm. that uh, for me, it, I, I always use Robert Caro as the template of writer, artist, whoever, who is never going to exist again. No one is going to give someone a 40 year open ended project of making a biography of Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. Similarly, do you feel that the the multi hundred page comic of your your yeah, scope and scale is something that's. I mean, you've talked about not. Yeah, probably not doing any more big, big scale works. But do you see that as as something that's kind of? It's hard to say. I'm. All, I must say, I'm perplexed at where anything is going. To tell you the truth, mm -hmm. but it does seem that right now, 
it, as we were as you were just saying, it is like a what have you done for me lately culture and out of sight, out of mind. I did feel it may not be still true right now, but I did feel a couple of years ago, a lot of the younger cartoonists I was talking to seemed to be working very hard to always have something online, like that every page you're working on, you scan it and you put it online so that people see it. And, um, you know, they're still they're constantly like not forgetting you. Yeah. Um, that is exhausting. And I certainly, I'm not interested in that. I just like the idea too of like, it's kind of like there's a quality of keeping things private that is has power. I feel like most of the artwork I do, nobody ever sees it. And there's if I could like if I was independently wealthy, I, I sometimes wonder if I wouldn't put it all in the closet and not like release any of it. Not because I'm worried about anyone's response. I think I have a pretty thick skin by this point, but it keeps everything so pure. I was like, uh, it's a funny thing to say, but like when yeah. you don't show things to other people, it really is just for you or it's just the way you wanted it. Or maybe even you're imagining after you're dead, people will read it and then, you know, that'll be great. You're not around anymore. Yeah, you don't and, have to worry about the... Uh... But, you know, you can't do that in the real world. You got to like, you got to make money and to make money, you have to do work. And even to do like your most personal work, you have to do work so that the opportunities remain that people are interested in what you're doing. So that means like if you don't publish anything for 10 years while you work on your giant graphic novel, when the time comes to publish your giant graphic novel, nobody's heard of you and nobody wants to publish it. So it is strange that you, well, it's not strange, but it, that's the nature of the beast of publishing. And it has always been that way. But I do think that the internet and digital culture has certainly sped that up dramatically. I feel like Maybe you can't even take a year off anymore. I don't know. It's yeah. like you've got to keep your name in front of people. Now I'm not worrying too much about that because no. you're not hustling I can't do for it. the same. You're not hustling yeah. for the same thing. Yeah, uh, exactly. Not basically. But I do worry for the young artists. Mm -hmm. I don't like to see them having to keep. Yeah, on the treadmill. Actually keep feeding the monster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to a guy who puts out 50 of these a year, but you yeah, know, but no, exactly. <laughs> this, this is okay one of my best time. It, though, Yo, that's, that's my the thing. thing you know? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's only when the the guest stands me up for half an hour. Yeah. I'm just kidding. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least a half an hour. <laughs> well, although let me ask you, you mentioned writing that you know, posthumous writing, basically. At the the Strand event, you talked about the um, that you're you're writing these. I don't know if it's stories or whatever about. Dominion, your, yeah. your, your small yeah. model city, um, that you don't foresee publishing or, or seeing the light yeah. of day. Is this one of those Heidegger black notebooks thing where we're afraid that it's actually going to reveal horrible things about no. you? As a, oh, good, good. Okay. No, actually, so. <laughs> just the opposite. The funny thing about them is they were not created to be published. So, yeah. but although we've reached the point now where, where I'm working on the, the work in them and I could see it published. I'm not writing it like exactly at an audience, but at a certain point... If you're doing a comic strip, it's like you're using the same skills, even if nobody sees it, than if you're planning to publish it. So it's perfectly, I just did like a 30 page strip in, in one of them that was, it's completely publishable. Um, I'm happy with it. It's, it's rough, but it's like, that could be published. And I might, you know, that might, some of the stuff in these books might show up somewhere. Mm -hmm. As Books in themselves, they would be strange books if you just publish them because they are written for me and they are like an exploration of the city. So some of it's comics, some of it's um, a lot of like just write, handwriting with drawings next to it. It's, I'm just working out ideas. They've become progressively more complex as I go along. So the early parts of these books are really rough because they were notes. But eventually at some point they're more like articles. So I might write an article on the mayors of Dominion. And that's where I'm like, I'm making up the history. Yeah. But it's, you could read it, although would anyone want to read it is another question. It's like, it's very, well, it would be a target market. Let's yes. put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but that work is important to me. And in some ways, I feel like if I keep doing it long enough, you know, I must be like in a couple of years, I'll be up around a thousand pages of writing or something on this stuff. That will be like um, a life's work. Although I'm not sure what value it has out in the world. It's I thought really you were going to say how say. valuable that life is. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, who knows though? But I mean, certainly I'm going to be doing a big Art of Seth kind of project in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And there will be pages from those notebooks in there for sure. 
they won't be like I remember when Chris Ware did his big monograph. Um, he produced some pages from his like comic strip diary, but he shrunk them so small you, could. you cannot <laughs> read them. And I was like, that was very smart, but this won't be like this. You'll yeah. be able to read it. I have to say, getting Chris's sketchbooks uh, from that that uh, um, Belgian publisher or whoever did this, yeah. and um, seeing his work not perfect. Yeah, and fine tune is one of those absolute revelations to oh, me. Oh yeah, as I know, you got none of you are perfect out of the box, and everything has to be worked through. But seeing someone whose stuff yeah. has that mechanical clarity to it all, and then oh, oh yeah, he has to sketch all the time to get to that yeah. point. That's you know, those sketchbooks were very interesting because they showed that Chris could um, he could draw any way he likes. Mm -hmm. it, it specifically emphasizes how carefully controlled and the decisions he's made in those books. Yeah. Now, do you miss the pamphlet form for comics? Do you miss the 24 or 32 page thing? Not I know for the, me. No? Not for me. Okay. But I would mi I miss reading them. Yeah. Like like when I used to read 8 Ball, for example. It was oh, a good yeah. example. It's like every issue of 8 Ball was like a self-contained experience for the most part. And it was so exciting to get it and to read it and that is a singular experience that's quite different than getting a graphic novel. Um, that was, you know, you always felt like there's something about the serialized quality of publishing in the comics form that even if the story isn't serialized, it's part of a process. Yeah. So you you watch an artist grow, you're excited to see where they're going, you don't know what the next issue is going to be. That's I think, is a valuable form, and to some degree it's lost. Um, there's still comic books being published in that in the pamphlet format, but the mainstream comic books, to me, that's not what I'm talking about. No, no. We, and, we mean, and again, the, yeah, art comics and quotes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, the, and the zine comics are different. Those are little complete experiences too, but they're not the same as like a comic book series. Maybe some of them are. But most of them are individual art objects in their own way. I do kind of miss that experience of, and I, of reading those. But I also think the young cartoonists are kind of getting robbed a bit because it's kind of tough to go from making a zine to making a graphic novel. You want to have that experience of working in a shorter format, but being published and distributed in like the the comic shop, yeah. newsstand, whatever, that world. That's a really great learning experience. I wouldn't have wanted at the age of 25 to have been like somebody say like, well, what's your graphic novel? Yeah, let's see your 200 page book. Yeah, and you got to have that done there and it's yeah. got to be good. That's very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something I wonder... So often we the things that we had in our golden age we just lament yeah. that well, it should be like this forever even though it wasn't there ten years earlier no. or, or ten Absolutely. years after. Uh, but we came up in that that era where I was a college student. You I was a little Chester, older, but yeah, you, but you yeah. Chester Joe, uh, Klaus, Bag, all those yeah. guys were just putting out periodicals, and it that was, was a good period, wasn't yeah, it? <laughs> awfully yeah. good, you know. And you wouldn't have like Jaime's work, Jaime Hernandez, yeah. right now. That work wouldn't exist if that world hadn't exist. Because, I mean, he's doing a kind of serialized um, life story that's been going on for 30 years now. Probably wouldn't be the same thing if he'd been brought up doing graphic novels. Well, they had that stretch where Love and Rockets went to an annual format. And yeah. he and Beto both said in interviews that didn't work. Yeah. Like they just, it was too much time, too much space, and too many things. Yeah. You kind of second guess because you had... You finished it, and then yeah. six months later, you came up with a few more ideas you wanted to put mm -hmm. in. Instead, you know, the deadline, the more regular deadline helps for, for both for of them. For sure. But, yeah. Um, actually, mentioning Jaime, uh, we talked a little yesterday about him and uh, the devotion to his characters. Uh, that, Absolutely. That characterizes his work. Have you ever felt that anything similar to those vibes, the way you know, Jaime really feels for, yeah. for particularly Maggie and Hopi, but... You know the various. Yeah, figures. it's funny. I was going to say no. Yeah. But uh, strangely, the like possibly the most slapdash of the books I ever did, Wimbledon Green. <laughs> That's I what I was like sort some, of wondering. I feel kind of like that they kind of came to life for me in a way. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could write another Wimbledon Green book, and it would just have it would come out on the page. It wouldn't have to be dreamed up. Like Wimbledon Green wasn't really dreamed up in the sense of what we were talking about earlier, where it's like I know where this is going and what it's all about. I just like had fun and let it create itself. I think like I could sit down and churn out another Wimbledon Green book and at the end I'd be like, oh, they surprised me. 
because there's something in the characters to me that I feel like it's the only instance in my life where I understood that thing where somebody says the characters write themselves. Yeah. Because everything else, I think I was writing it. Right. And there's yeah. a sense of, I don't want to say whimsy, but yeah. you know, just unfetteredness about that. Yeah, and I feel kind of books. affection for them. I liked Wimbledon. So, and I don't know if I feel that sense of, you know, authorial affection for any of the other characters particularly. They're characters. They're part of an artistic process. Mm-hmm. Wimbledon Green feels more like, yeah, that those, it's almost like something I might have read that I didn't do. Yeah. yeah do you feel a sense of... Not that characters are, you know, assigned roles necessarily, but, mm-hmm. you know, a, 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 I say a sort of schematic for them based on the story. Sure. I mean, they fill a purpose. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You, they take on deeper quality as you allow them to be vessels mm-hmm. for what you pour into them. But you pick them for a reason. I certainly think like that Clyde Fans is a perfect example of that. There were characters contrived based on a certain, like I had a certain idea. We'll have one guy like this and one like that. And then you spend... A certain amount of time pouring content and emotion into them and hopefully they take on like a kind of life of their own on the page for the reader that they don't feel like they're just you know like oh the theme of this book is blah 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 you know that they have more life to them than that this character is symbol of x exactly but in a weird way when you're doing the writing there is something a little um cold about it a little um, a bit like you're a doctor and yeah. these are, you know, your tools. It's sort of clinical. Yeah. 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 And any sense of, geez, I can't believe I have to do this to character X, but I have to do this to character X. Is that a... Yeah. <laughs> no, in a way, I don't actually feel that with them because some of them, it's like the bad moment that's coming is the bad moment that was planned. Yeah. I think I would have felt like bad if I, with something like Wimbledon Green, it'd be like, I wouldn't want to humiliate. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Because I like them. <laughs> By the way, um, Signings, yeah. We we now seen you at the Strand, you know, doing the yeah. the, the signing line where a guy actually showed up with fully bound uh, edition of all of your, mm-hmm. your pamphlet size Palooka nice. bills. Um, how do you get accustomed to the the whole signing thing, the phenomenon, even just yeah. the physical posture of looking up at these people as they they bring you your yeah. work to to be. Well, I'm, I've probably mentioned, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this, but you know it, of course. My wife is a barber. Mm-hmm. And uh, after about a, you know, in her first year of being a barber, she said to me, um, being a barber isn't about cutting hair, it's about talking to people. And I was like, oh, that's a very interesting insight. And she spends more time thinking about how you have a conversation with people than cutting their hair. At a certain point, cutting the hair is second nature. Mm-hmm. So signings are like that, too. People don't come up to get their book signed because they want a signature. They come up because they want to have a moment with you. So the real experience, the real thing that signing is about is your patter. The patter you develop, everybody has a patter in their life, and that patter is really important for like interacting with people. So I try not to repeat things exactly from person to person, but you have like little things where you talk to them. That's what it's really about. The drawing, the sketch. I draw. I have a pretty routine thing. I have several drawings I do, and you draw that sketch quick or slow based on the amount of time you want to spend with the person. It's like it. The drawing gets longer if the conversation gets longer, and the drawing gets shorter if, if the person you know doesn't really you know they just yeah. want a short experience. So it's funny that I find like, I certain <laughs> people are always like, oh your your wrist must get tired from drawing. It's like no, your, your wrist doesn't get tired from drawing. You get tired from talking. It's the talking experience. But that's like, I think, I remember when I would go up to get a book signed, it's like I was excited to talk to the person I wanted a signature. And that's kind of what I keep in my mind when they come up. So I have like my usual stuff. You ask questions. Yeah. It's like anything. You know this. As an interviewer, you ask questions. And then people talk. And that's what, yeah. And then you follow that. Was there uh, an anxiety on your part early on with the I have to be completely unique and original to every single person who comes to the line? Or were you pretty cognizant yeah. that, you know... No, in the beginning, yeah. you're you're too stupid to even think okay, that. Okay, good. I, I like assume that just, was the case. Yeah, you know, no, yeah. I, I don't want that person to think I said yeah. the same thing to this person. Yeah. yeah, but you do develop... The one thing you quickly figure out is that you have to have a, a handful of drawings you do for the different books because you don't want... You generally don't want people to see you giving them the exact same drawing mm-hmm. you've given somebody else. Some, some artists do the exact same drawing every single... But if you develop like, you know, five or six drawings for each book, 
you can vary them so that person six in line doesn't see your back on drawing number one again. Yeah. It's a bit, it is irritating, but you know, you can't make up a new idea for a drawing every book. It's funny. You just, I don't have that much imagination or, and the, and the truth is those drawings will be bad because you're, you're, you're working start, them out. You're like I'm yeah. working it out. Those are always, yeah. When somebody comes up to you and they say, could you draw a picture of an aardvark driving a car? Cause that's what I like. It's like, those are always terrible drawings. Yeah. Now, maybe if everybody asked for that same drawing, by, by drawing five, you'd be, I got yeah. it. I got it down now. <laughs> I've um, always marveled over that because I, I would never presume to ask you guys, hey, can you draw? Unless it's like a yeah. commission drawing thing yeah. where I once had Roger Langridge draw me as an ape reading poetry because that's <laughs> what I feel like when I'm reading poetry, yeah. the gorilla wearing a, a, a <laughs> dressing gown and, yeah. and smoking a bubble pipe, uh, wearing a fez. But yeah, otherwise, yeah, generally, no, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, you guys... It's yeah. so, you know, you it's already know fine. what you have to, to yeah. draw. I'm not, you're yeah, I'm not encouraging gonna... it, but it's yeah. fine. <laughs> and do you remember, because uh, I don't think I've ever hit you with yeah. this one, The uh, any freak out moments when you met artists who were your big influences or inspirations? Well, You mentioned going to a signings. Yeah. So. No, I remember the one that sticks in my mind. I didn't go to a ton of signings, but I remember I went to see Linda Barry mm -hmm. when I was, you know, before I was published. Yeah. And um, I was a huge Linda Barry fan. Through the newspaper, because she was in our alternative newspaper, Now Magazine, here in Toronto. And um, I was really nervous to meet her, and I had all her books. She had a good number of books by that yeah. point. And um, I remember I'd never been, to, I think I'd never been to a book signing before this. So I, I thought as I was in line, I thought, I've got all her books but one. I thought, oh, she's going to be offended <laughs> that I don't have that one book. She's going to be like, you. yeah, like, oh, I see you didn't like that one, eh? But so I had like 10 books on me. But fortunately, watching people in the line in front of me, I figured out that you don't ask them to sign all 10 books. So then when I got there, I was like, I just presented her with one book to sign. And uh, but I was really nervous. I was shaking. And I occasionally see somebody come up shaky to me. And it always like strikes me as ridiculous. But I can remember being, being that guy. literally. Yeah, I was really nervous because you want them to like you. Yeah, that's the funny part. It's like I wasn't there because I wanted a signature in my book. I was there because I wanted Linda Berry to like me. Uh, yeah. Summer Pierre tells a story of taking some class with Linda Berry, thinking that it was the how does Summer Pierre and Linda Berry how do they become best friends yeah, class, and then exactly. realizing no, no, it's just a class on creative writing. This is not going mm -hmm. to, to turn into my yeah. new best friend. Yeah, exactly. Um, although I, I will share the anecdote of being at Small Press Expo many years mm -hmm. ago, or a few years ago. Um, basically, Drew Friedman shoved me into the green room to get myself some breakfast uh, because he felt I was underfed. <laughs> and I walk into the room, and the only people there are the organizer of SPX, uh, Tom Tamaro, Dan Perkins, yep. uh, Linda, and Jules Pfeiffer. Okay. And me. And so <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, Drew's told me to come in and get a bagel. And I, I get a little food, go to the far yeah. end of the room, far as I can get. Pfeiffer comes right over and sits down next to me to yeah. find out who I am, what I do, et cetera. So I That's pitch nice. him on the podcast. Yeah. Well, but Linda comes up to him with, uh, Jules, I was just wondering, now that everybody's gone, can we get a selfie together? <laughs> and there was that moment where you know they're taking these sh pictures yeah. together. All of us are taking pictures of the two of them taking pictures. And then I think it was Linda who said, and can you sign something for me, Jules? And all yeah. of a sudden, Warren and Dan are both taking things out of their bags. Yeah. Everybody had Pfeiffer stuff they wanted, oh, I bet. They wanted yeah. Jules to sign because yeah. whatever the hierarchy is, yeah. whoever has the freak out thing, there's someone greater it's than you. It's generational. You, you know, yeah. I, even, you know, when we were at the Strand, Art Spiegelman was there, and Art and I are friends now, but that does not... That he's that still does, Art Spiegelman It does to not you. diminish in any way. Every time I still see Art, I remember being the young cartoonist who wrote him a letter. You know, like that's... And then I often think to myself, that young cartoonist would be so impressed that I'm friends with Art <laughs> Spiegelman now. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't diminish. That stays true. Now, when you mentioned Linda, had you uh, wanted something besides the form of comics that you're in? Had you thought of when you were coming up alt-weekly... I know you, yeah. you came up with, you know, Mr. X also. Yeah. And then the, yeah. had you had those sorts of aspirations, either the superhero world, uh, the alt-weekly world? Well, when I was world? a teenager, of course, I wanted to dress Spider-Man or whatever. Yeah. Um, by the time I was working on Mr. X, I was realizing I wanted to make comic art, like art comics. Yeah. But I was still young enough that I don't think I really knew even what that meant. Mm -hmm. I was excited about, like, the work that was being done then. Like, I was reading Crumb. I was reading the Hernandez Brothers. I was reading Harvey Picar. I was reading Linda Berry. This sort of stuff, early 80s. Um, 
And, but while working on Mr. X, I think is when I finally realized I wanted to do my own comic and what kind of work it would be, that it would be autobiographical. The interesting thing is, though, nothing's ever set in stone. So if somebody had come to me at that point and said, would you like to do a strip in the alternative newspaper, I probably would have been sure. And that might have meant learning a totally, totally different set of skills. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I was, it was always comic books for me. So because I followed my own path, I knew I wanted to do comic books. I, I certainly, there was a time I remember where um, they threw out like a cattle call for people to, to try out to do Nancy way back in the oh, yeah, yeah. early, at the same uh, time Ivan was trying out, I was I was say, trying, they Brunetti came to was, me too. Yeah. And, you know, I did up a few samples and I sometimes think like, what would have happened if I'd gotten Nancy? Um, it probably would have destroyed my life for one thing, because <laughs> yeah. you can't do your own work at the same time as churning out that much work. But there's always these like focal points when things could have changed. I'm grateful though that it followed along that that straightforward path, because for me the comics comics narrative is connected most specifically to comic books, telling a longer story. That's kind of where the language that eventually I've been working on refining comes from. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful that's the way it went. Mm -hmm. And have you thought nonfiction? No, not really. I mean, beyond like the idea of... Um, not autobiographical, but like yeah. Chester's Louis Riel. Yeah. You know, no, I'm not big on... I mean, I've had, I've had moments where yeah. I thought about it. Uh, many years ago, there was a famous criminal case here in Canada I considered... The adapting. serial killer one where it turned out to be the woman and not the guy? <laughs> no. Oh, thank God, because supposedly I look like the guy, which really bummed me out when a Canadian oh, pal pointed a Hamolka about. or yeah, something yes, like that. Yes, exactly, yeah. Paul yeah. and Bernardo and Hamolka. Yeah. yeah, no, no, it was not that. It was a much okay. older story. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, you don't want to look like that. Bernardo. No, I was really bummed out when I heard that. I had to look it up. My like, yeah. he's not too yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's bad news. Um, and there's been, you know, there's been things here and there, but actually I think I'm probably less inclined to think in that direction than I used to be because it's become... Almost like um, the, a, a cliche at the moment of uh, ad adaptation or nonfiction. I feel like every publisher right now is crunching out like comic biographies of you know whoever or adaptions. It's like Handmaid's Tale here and yeah. you know Life of Tolstoy there, or whatever. It feels like too much of that is going on right now because I think they're a good sell. Yeah, um, I think that would steer me off of it for a while. I'm, and God forbid yeah. you do something that, that has market appeal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you can, yeah, if you can actually do it right. But that's yeah. the trick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've got the uniform, you know, the, the the suits, the sure. the yeah. old timey guy thing. At home, is it is it sweatpants and like a, a Blue Jays jersey? Is, is there any you no, know, downtime is, for no, Seth? Is that no. a, <laughs> I have a more casual uniform for at home, but it yeah. is involve a white shirt, a pair of pants, a tie, and but a shop coat that goes over it yeah. for working. So, yeah, I think I saw that in the documentary. Yeah, the, the, the exactly. Seth's Dominion. No, I mean, I it's like I don't own a pair of shorts. Yeah. I don't own. A, I've never owned a pair of sweatpants. Thank God, never. <laughs> and um, I don't. I think I even own a T-shirt that doesn't have an image on it that I drew that somebody like gave me a copy. Yeah, like that. The, sitting the, the in show T-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, no, I think my wife would drop dead if she saw me in a T-shirt. And recreation. Recreation? Oh well, I mean, what yeah. do I like to do? I like you. Nothing that would surprise anyone. I like to. I go shopping. I co I'm a collector. We go to antique malls. Mm -hmm. A lot of driving around. A lot of looking for old restaurants and places to frequent. And um, for the last ten years, my wife and I have been very obsessed with finding the last couple of piano bars that exist, <laughs> where you sit around the piano, and you know, and talk to people you've never met before. It's um, actually, and everybody there is 20 years older than me. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Yeah. That's sort of like the demographic for my show. That, that's yeah. Fine. Exactly. <laughs> Miss Toronto? When you come Not back like this? generally because yeah. it's so busy. It took me two and a half hours to drive in last oh, night. Jeez. Um, but that said, I was walking down to the AGO book launch on Wednesday from the Marriott Hotel where we are now. And I walked along Bluer. And cut down onto University, St. George to University, and the sunlight was so beautiful. It was particularly golden. And suddenly all the buildings, all the mirrored buildings were streaming like rivers of light onto the old structures. And I was like, Toronto is beautiful. So it was like maybe one of the most romantic visions I've had of the city in 
in the 20 years since I've left. So it still has its ability to charm. It's good to know. Seth, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thanks, Gil. I always enjoy being here with you. And that was Seth. His new book, From Drawn and Quarterly, is Clyde Fans. You can find that in better bookstores and comic stores. And you can look up Drawn and Quarterly to find out more about the book and their other publications from Seth, including George Sprott, Wimbledon Green, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, etc. Um, Seth, as you can imagine, does not have a social media presence. Near as I can tell, he is not on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or anything else. The old-timey thing... That brand is strong. So if you want to reach him, uh, go through Drawn and Quarterly. But you really will be well served by reading all of his comics and checking out the books he's done design for because those sorts of artists are ones who, as we talked about, were his historical precursors and the, the artists who have meant the most to him. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Seth, so who have you been reading? And he asked me the same thing. So if you want to hear our answers to that, and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The first quarter 2019 episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Jerome Charon, Peter Cooper, Edmund White, Eva Hagberg-Fisher, Mort Gerberg, James Osland, Joe Chardello, James Sturm, Martin Hagland, Bram Presser, and Nathan Englander. You can support the Virtual Memories Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode. I've got to sit down and start scanning more of those. Uh, my secret project, which who knows what I'll get back to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. I recorded the first part of this one at the Strand Bookstore in New York City, and that cost the usual George Washington Bridge toll of 12 bucks, about 30 bucks for parking, $6 for the subway. The second part was recorded during TCAF weekend, um, the expenses for which I'm still piling up, uh, flights, hotels, parking, dog sitting, etc. Um, I did have a good business meeting while I was there also, so I'll expense a little of the trip to my, my work, but otherwise, this was all me. I did get three other podcasts out of it with Nina Bunjavac, Bill Griffith, and Carl Stevens, so that spreads out some of the cost, I guess. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Buzz Sawyer, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Now, our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. Check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and check out his art while you're there. And go listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with the impromptu podcast I recorded in Toronto with the great cartoonist Nina Bunjevac, who has a brand new book out from Fantagraphics called Bezamina. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get in our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, 
and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk about it on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Music